But we're just going to talk this morning because one thing I, I realized, this is the fifth Sunday of the series, and just to kind of let you in on how series work around here, is basically we kind of look ahead a few months or sometimes more than that, and think about like not just, hey, this is a scripture I want to teach. It's more like, hey, this is a problem that we have in our world and then kind of go to scripture and try to find a solution. And so I remember back in the winter, I was thinking about summer and I, I, this might have even been around Christmas, thinking about this idea of Jesus talking about you know, whether we would, you know, build our houses on sand or on rock, and it seems like sort of a summary series to do, and we came up with a catchy name, Sandcastle Mortgage, and go, hey, you wouldn't, you know, you might build a sandcastle, but you wouldn't take a 30-year mortgage on a sandcastle, and I was like, this is going to be fun, and I imagined it being really sort of light and, hey, summary, and I know people are going on vacations. I don't think it's turned out that way, at least maybe from my perspective, it feels like, oh, this is kind of heavy sometimes, it's kind of dark, because you're talking about something so, so difficult, this idea of things that don't last, of sort of investing your life, which your house is not your biggest investment, it probably shouldn't be anyway, but your life is your biggest investment, actually, because you only have one of them, and we're all sort of going toward this end at some point and we don't even know when that is so I just want to read this scripture and then I just want to talk to you and sort of maybe try to wrap this up as we sort of just think together about this um, I'll read the scripture and then, then I just want to talk about something that I was thinking this week about it Jesus said these words, and it's a story that's not true, but it's still true. I mean, that's the amazing thing about this story is it's like, it's not a true story, but man, is it filled with truth because it's something that still works. It's still true that you should build on rock and not on sand. He said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, <laughs> I realize I'm going to fall off this chair, and you're going to think I'm drunk. I'm not, unless I'm drunk on eggs. Um, but the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand, and the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great force. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, God, this is a difficult passage once you get it. It's a difficult thought to think that you could spend your life doing lots of activities and not have a great investment at the end. It's even harder to imagine, God, that we would sort of do all of these things in life and then crash and burn at some point. And God, I know that all of us are at different spots this morning. And God, some of us have gone through a crash and some of us are in the middle of a crash and some of us can't even imagine that a crash would ever happen. But God, I pray that you would just speak through your plan and your word this morning. In your name we pray. And so... First of all, let's just sort of break through the metaphor. I think we should do that this morning and realize that Jesus is not really that interested in teaching safe building practices. Was Jesus for safe building practices? Absolutely. He was a carpenter. But this is really not a story about urging people, you know, let's, let's break the metaphor on the last week. We don't have to carry on with that. Like, He's not that concerned about going, hey, I want to make sure that your foundation is strong at home. He's making a metaphor, and he's making a pretty pointed metaphor about their culture then. And the thing that I've been thinking a lot about is, wow, that's true today. In fact, I said this on the first week, and I just want you to think, and let's just be really clear with each other, and I'm just going to say it and not make this a metaphor, but think about it like we live in a culture that urges us on every hand, like basically everything in our culture and everything in our world urges us to do exactly the opposite of this. Jesus is saying, you should follow the Bible, you should follow my plan, you should listen to God the creator, and you should do what he says because that's the wisest way to live. And I'm sure this morning that nobody else, I'm not saying nobody else, maybe you listen to a, a Christian podcast or something, but nothing on the news, nothing on social media, nothing in sort of your, your uh Time frame, nothing, nothing in, on Netflix has pointed you this week to go, hey, you should listen to God. You should believe in the creator and you should do what he says because that's not the culture we live in. And guess what, gang? That's not the culture they lived in then. In fact, everything in our world, if you think about it, just, just 
breaking the metaphor apart, everything in our world sort of says, no, 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 no. Don't build on rock. Don't build on what the Bible says. That's so old. Don't build on what scripture says. Don't build on what Jesus said. Like there's so many shortcuts. And there are, right? There are legitimate shortcuts around. I mean, think about, I've used this example, but it's so clear. Like sexuality in the Bible. It's like, oh my goodness, you're going, <laughs> you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to do courtship and then marriage and you know one person for your whole life and somehow you're going to have to be sort of nice enough to them that they'll have sex with you I mean it's a long long difficult process or there are a lot quicker ways to sexuality right there are a lot of shortcuts there's a hookup culture there's apps for that and that's what our world says and it's not just sexuality it's every area of our life Think about like what the Bible says about fame and about building a good name. It's a slow process. You've got to go on for generations and generations and have great character and keep your word and raise kids that follow God. I mean, it's a slow, long slog to have character the way the Bible says and to have influence. But Or you could get on Instagram and get a bunch of followers and you could kind of make, take pictures of your butt or something and gain, gain a lot of notoriety and gain fame really quickly and it would be so much easier. And so our culture says, don't listen to what the Bible says. Don't do what oh, all those old books say. Do something quicker and quite frankly, cheaper, right? Because living life, and I'll just say this because it's true and it's not like I'm against it because I believe that Jesus was right. But it takes a lot more investment to live the way Jesus taught, right? Like it's going to cost you something. Let's be clear about that. It costs you something. Like just like if you could build a house without digging a hole and without setting a foundation um, and you can. They're called mobile homes. Now, I'm not making fun of mobile homes because I'm the only person in this room that got turned down for a mobile home loan. And I am not joking about that. When Michelle and I were first married, I was like, we should get a mobile home. That, that's, I'm from Missouri. It seemed like a good idea. And we literally got turned down for $30,000 mobile home. So I'm not making fun of mobile homes. I'm telling you. But, but think about this. Like that is the thing. It would cost so much less not to have a foundation. And that's what our culture says. Man, don't, don't do what the Bible says. It's so long and it's so slow and it'll cost you so many opportunities. And guess what? There are places that our culture will tell you that you can live Things that you can do that are not allowed by the Bible at all. And so there's places that you can go and, and it's so much, you know, our culture would say it's so much better and it's popular. We don't even live in a culture where like when you don't follow the Bible, it's sort of like, ooh, they're bad people. And the people that aren't here at church this morning, it's not like people are looking down on them. They're like, we don't even miss the people at church because we're at Lowe's this morning. I know because every time I'm off, for some reason I go to Lowe's for something on a Sunday morning and I just go... It's packed here. I, I imagine in my church bubble, people are church. Oh, they're not. You know, and it's like in every area of our life, it's not like people are like, oh, the people who don't follow the Bible, they're bad people. No, 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 no. It's popular to not do. And here's the thing. Most people that you'll talk to go, hey, I've been living this way my whole life. That hasn't crashed. I don't need a foundation necessarily. I don't need to base my life on the Bible. I don't need to base my life on Jesus' teaching. It's going great. And finally, the truth is we all kind of go, my house, my life, I can build this however I want to. And so I guess what I'm saying to you this morning, and I'd hate to be a total bummer, but I just have to say, like, there's a million ways. Um, there's a million shortcuts to building a life that crashes. There just is. Like, there's a million ways to screw up your life. Like, I've done about 499,000 of them. I've tried them. There's a million ways outside of Jesus' way and outside of Scripture and outside of, like, the tried and true. Um, there's a million shortcuts, and you can screw up your life, and you can screw up, and it's just easy to do. And honestly, a lot of people will applaud you and go, you're so brave on the way to your crash. And so what, but, but, but here's the thing, and, and kind of to harken back to last week, and I probably won't use harken again today because that sounded weird coming out of my mouth. Um, <laughs> but to kind of look back at last week, those are all ways to make a life that doesn't last, you know, that doesn't stand up to the test of time, that doesn't stand up to the great storm or, or, or judgment or whatever you want to call it. But what does it take to build a house that stands. Last week, we met a guy named Dr. LeBron Lackey, and it was an amazing story. If you were here or if not, you should check out the story. Just Google it. Like one house on Mexico Beach, Florida, 
um, was standing after Hurricane Michael. Like, literally, the guy drives back into town, and, and I just can't imagine that feeling. He said it was, even though he was sad for all his neighbors, driving into the town and going, my house is still standing. And it wasn't a miracle, and it wasn't an accident. It was a story of a guy who just made different decisions than everyone else. Who didn't just build the code, who didn't just build the way everybody else built, but he was just meticulous and just honestly a little obsessed about building a house that was so strong that they had 155 mile an hour winds and he lost a ceiling fan outside on the deck. That's what he lost. And it's like, wow, that's amazing. And so I want to talk to you this morning and just talk to you. I don't know if this is a sermon. This is just, I'd like to talk to you about like, okay, if we're going to be like that guy, you know, let's get specific about sort of understanding what it would take to build a life that lasts, to build a life according to scripture. What does that even mean? You know, I have to follow a bunch of rules. And last week we learned like, oh no, just obeying the code won't get you there. And here's another thing we need to think about, and I think about a lot, like most of us aren't new construction, right? Like most of us are not starting today and going, okay, Don, I've just arrived on this planet and I'm willing to start brand new building my life based on the principles of God. I don't think there's anyone in here that that's true of, right? Like all of us have already been building a life. And maybe we started out as followers of God or maybe we are followers of God, but None of us are like sort of making that call for the first time and we have nothing in our past. We all have our own past. We all have all of the decisions we've made up to this point and this picture sort of encapsulates that. This is a picture of a a house on the Jersey Shore being put on a brand new foundation. They had built this house and I got a lot of these pictures from this from Superstorm Sandy, which wasn't even a hurricane. It wasn't strong enough to be called a hurricane actually. Um, but they had to put it on a new foundation, and that's actually possible. If you look, they've jacked up the whole house, and they've actually constructed this new foundation that's driven down the proper amount into, into the sand, down to the rock, and they're going to set this house on a new foundation, and it is not easy, and it is not cheap. I can't even imagine doing that, but it is possible. And so some of us here this morning are like, yeah, but I've made all these decisions in the past, and I've sort of got this whole life behind me, and how in the world would I start? Well, it's possible. Um, So where would we start? Where would we start if we were going to build a life that Jesus was talking about, where he said, like, when when the storm comes... And when the winds rise and when the water comes and, you know, when, when everything goes wrong, that we've built this solid, lasting life that sort of nothing can take it away. And I think it would be important, and I think the starting place is probably start with the truth. I, I want to read you the, the thing I've been reading every week, but I'm going to kind of zoom out a little bit. I'm going to read what comes right before that and right after, and I want you to notice what they say after this teaching. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, this is Jesus talking, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. So from that we know, and I've been saying this every week, that Christ followers have to follow Christ. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's true. It's not just like you can put the patch on or, you know, like you can fly a Christian flag and go, now I'm a Christian. It's like, yes, you identify as a Christian, but you also do what Christ said. And so it says on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and we cast out demons in your name and we performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me. You who break God's laws. Now that is sort of disturbing and this is why maybe this whole deal is a little heavy is because he's not even saying, you know those people who didn't believe in me and you know those people who sort of like laughed at me and mocked me, you know the people that crucified me, they're out. He's like, no, there's gonna be a lot of people who sort of think they're in and aren't in. There's gonna be a lot of people who have built a house but it actually doesn't stand the storm. And then he says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. And though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. 
And when the rains came and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it collapses with a mighty crash. And that's where we've been stopping, but I want to read the last two verses. Check them out on screen. It said, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. See, the difference about Jesus and the difference about the way of Jesus, if you think about it, is Jesus didn't just point out problems. <laughs> like, we live in a world where lots of people can point out problems and then go, hey, if, if you other people would change, if we could pass some legislation or if we could make some changes in Washington or if we could just get people to do this thing that I want them to do, then the world would change. That's not what Jesus did at all. That's what anybody can do. What Jesus said is, hey, if you would do what I say, if you would do this thing yourself, your life would change. I mean, that's a very different thing. It's not if somebody else will do this, then you'd be better. He's like, no, I've got a way, and here's the way you do it. And if you do these things, you yourself will change. And that's a powerful thing. And here's the way I think we could think about it. And I've been thinking a lot about an analogy for this, and I've struggled with this because I don't want to come to you this morning and go, you know what? Our culture doesn't believe in, you know, the, the Bible, and our culture doesn't urge you to be in the Bible, so our culture is bad, and our culture, you need to, that's no way to live. I want you to think about it like this, and I was thinking about it like this. We need to consult designers and decorators. Let's, let's use the building metaphor. I, I love building. I like building shows. I work in the trades, and, and, and so follow me along in this. There are designers and decorators, and they are super important. Like, because design changes and decoration changes and we need people who kind of tell us what's in fashion and what looks good now because it does changes, change so much. It's funny, even as a painting contractor, like 10 years ago, I painted, and I see it from the uh, sort of the meta, it's funny because like I paint the same colors all the time. But the funny thing is the colors change. Like right now, there's a gray and there's a tan with white trim and white ceilings and that's every house that I sell they all look like that. They're one of those because those are the hot colors and, and they might change the shade or change the name, but it's still the same color scheme. I have the tan in my house. You know, I paint the gray all the time. That seems to be gaining it. And, and 10 years ago, it's funny, like it was like a deep taupe, like a, it was a, uh, I forgot what it's called, um, God, I should know the color. I painted it a billion times. But there was, a, there was a deep taupe, dark brown color with the white. And then there was a blue color. And it was funny because those colors are like everybody goes, you know what I'm going to paint? I'm going to paint the hot new color. But it's all the same because that's what's popular. And so we learned that from designers and decorators. And like I built it, we built our house in the 90s. And so we had shiny brass everything. You know, it was amazing. Like every fixture in the house like was super shiny brass. And you're like, this is amazing. Look how modern this looks. And like 10 years later, you're like, God, we got to get rid of all that brass. And we start taking it out. I remember the first time we changed the door hardware. My wife's like, we should get new knobs. And I was like, well, okay. And I went and spent like $760 at Lowe's. And she's like, knobs cost that, you know, because it's what you do. Like they change over time. So, so decorators and designers, honestly, very, very important. And they, they, they show us what's on the cutting edge and what's coming next. But, but here's the problem. And here's what we need to think about. We need to listen to them and we need to learn from them and, and culture changes just like style changes. But we have to really listen to architects and engineers, right? Because, because here's the thing, like, um, I don't know if you've watched any remodeling shows right now, all they do is take walls out. Have <laughs> you noticed? They're like, we've got to open this place up. We've got to take the walls out. It feels like if you watch a decorating show or I watch HGTV and it's like, it feels like they don't like walls at all. Like all they want to do is take walls out, right? And it's like, we'll have no walls. We'll have a roof floating here. And you know, it's like, that would be the perfect house. And so what is everybody doing? Going, yeah, I'm just going to take walls out. Well, the problem with that is if you're not very careful, you know, it's like unless you consult an engineer or consult an architect and you know what's bearing, load bearing, you can end up with a place that's very un structurally unsound. I've seen it happen. And it's funny because then people are like, can you fix the ceiling? It's cracking. Or can you fix it? It's like it's cracking because it's falling down because you've got something missing. Like you didn't carry that load correctly because here's the thing about engineering and architecture. Like they don't change. 
Styles change, but specifications and standards don't change because gravity is gravity. Like, you have to support the center of your house with either a beam or a wall. It can't just float there. It never will. It doesn't matter what the style is. It's, there's, a, there's a thing thing that you have to do. Good, in, good engineering doesn't change. Like, the standards are changed. And... Plumbing's the same way. Water's always going to go downhill. You know, it's so funny. People are like, well, I'd like a bathroom up there. Well, that's awesome and possible. Or I'd like a bathroom down there. Well, that's possible. But we have to figure out a way to move the water because it won't flow uphill. It never will. That's never going to change. And so there are just things like that. So I think it's great to think about our lives in the same way. And that's what Jesus was doing as a carpenter going, life is sort of like building in the fact that, like, we can change. Like, if you, if you look at the family, I think that's something that's really changed. And we can think about, like, the family is not exactly what it was in Jesus' time when he's talking about this, you know. Um, it's not like, okay, the right way to have a family is you have an older dad and you raise goats. And then he gets, like, a 14-year-old bride. You know, like, no, no, no. It doesn't have to stay that way. Like, there's been a lot of, of changes in the family that I think are absolutely good. Like, hey, you know what? There are a lot of different, different ways that we live. Like, we couldn't even imagine like that. But, but here's the thing. There are some parts of a family that are structural. Just like there's parts of a house that are structural and water won't flow uphill and you need the right load-bearing wall or a beam or your house is going to crash. Like this is a picture also from um, Long Island. This is another picture from Superstorm Sandy. And if you notice, they've tried to move this house and it broke in half. And I was reading the story and the story was the design was bad on the house. It wasn't even the storm. It said this house would have fallen down anyway. And if you look, notice, it looks amazing. Like it looks really modern and really cool. But structurally, it was not designed well. They listened to the designer and not enough to the architecture. And it wasn't structurally sound. And that's the world we live in. That we can go, hey, hey, you know what? We don't, I, I, we don't have to be unchanging you know, we don't have to go, dad has to work on a goat farm, and mom stays home, and grinds grain, and that's the way they did it in the Bible, and that's good enough. For me. Of course not. But when we go, you know what? Culture is saying that we don't even need a dad anymore. Maybe two dads or two moms or no dad and a grandma. It, it, no. That's a structural part of this house. There's structural parts of this house. Water doesn't run uphill. And you got to meet, you know, that's like we have to have a, a load-bearing wall. It needs a beam or it needs a wall there. Or it needs a post. You can't just take it out. And there's so many things in our culture. And it's not about we don't like change. It's not about we, we hate different. It's about we have to, you know, we consult designers. We consult culture. It's okay, look around this room. Like, this is very different than your mom and dad's church, but there are some structural things that if we don't do them and we don't follow, this church will crash because we have to listen to architecture and engineers because they don't change. King David said it this way. Basically, he said, follow the blueprint. He said, God's way is perfect. All of the Lord's promises prove true. And he is a shield for those who look to him for protection. For who is God except the Lord? And who is our God? Who but our God is a solid rock? See, that, even though that was years before Christ, that's a pretty good picture of what it would be to build a life based on Christ. We talk about the word righteous, you know, righteous sounds weird, but it really is just right. He said all of God's ways are right. It, it's consulting the architect. Think about it, the architect of the world instead of just listening to designers. And here, here's the truth about it is, digging is going to get tough at times. Like, it's going to get tough. And I want to point out, like, this is not going to be a smooth path. That's me. That's going to, it's not going to be a smooth path all the time. Like, sometimes we're going to get very, very discouraged with this thing of trying to follow God because it feels like we're just slugging and digging. And we, truthfully, we are. Like, digging a foundation is sort of, in this life, not in building, sort of an unending thing. I want to read you something that Peter said. Peter, the the person we sort of like based our church on says at this point many of the disciples turned away and deserted him and Jesus turned to the 12 and said are you going to leave 
And Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. See, it's interesting to think about like Peter almost left. Most of the people almost left. Most of the people did leave Jesus at some point because they're like, this is too hard. This is too expensive. This is too tough. This is, this is restrictive. But Peter got it right and he said, I, I don't know where else to go because you have the words of life. And it's, it's back to sort of the analogy of designers versus architects or, or decorators versus engineers. Like there's a lot of things in our culture. There's a ton of things in our culture that are good that we can learn from. Like I, some things I look at and I'm like, I like that people are nicer to each other. You know, it's weird. Like when I was a kid, you would hold a door open for a lady. Have you noticed like this is a good thing in our culture. They hold it. Maybe it's just because I'm getting old. Now I'm feeling bad. Like they look at me like I can't open a door, but people hold the door open for me. I'm like, that's a good thing. Like we hold the door open for everybody now. I'm not going, dang you, I'm not a woman. You shouldn't hold the door. I'm like, no, that's good. We hold the door open for everybody. So we don't have to rage against the decorators and rage and go, things have to stay the same but when everything come and we go I don't think that's structurally sound I need to check the blueprint I need to check the book I need to see if that's allowed under my building plan from the architect well that's what the church is about it's so funny because in that moment when Peter said I, I don't have anywhere else to go I'll stick with you and later on, he was the first one to go, ah, lots of people say you're a prophet, but I say you're the Christ. God, or Jesus said to him, now I say to you, you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And we know that's true because we're sitting in a church thousands of years later, but there's no reason that we should exist in this culture we do. We're a bunch of volunteer misfit toys here having breakfast together, talking about Jesus. That's crazy, but it works. I want to switch over here. I want to introduce you to a couple more people before the band comes back up. Here's another guy I like. I realized maybe you grew up in a church like I did and uh, sang this hymn or heard this song. We're going to end with it today. What I didn't realize is that Edward Moat, kind of on our construction theme, he was a cabinet maker. Um, he was a cabinet maker until he was 55 years old. Um, I can't even imagine that. He worked. At, he had his own cabinet shop. He worked in the trades for 55, or not 55 years, but for until he was 55 years old, he retired from cabinet making, closed his shop, and he started and actually built, uh, I, I really admire this guy, he built a church um, in Staffordshire, England, the Rehoboth Baptist Church. And he preached there for 26 years until he died, like right before he died at 76. Um, never retired. This was his retirement. But Edward Moat, this, car, this, this, this cabinet maker, wrote these words based on the story we've been talking about. And, and, and they're so amazing because what he said, he said, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. And when darkness hides his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. And every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. And then this refrain that just sticks in your head, I still remember it. It says, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. See, in 1834, 1800 years after Peter, 4,600 years after King David would say that, 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years after Jesus, still... This cabinet maker in England is going, you know what? There's nothing else that I could base my life on that's better than this. And I guess that's what I would say to you this morning. I've been thinking about this, like, why do I believe this? I mean, I'm an unlikely Christian, if you think about it. Now, partially I was raised in a Christian home. That's where I was introduced to this. That's why I know. Interestingly enough, Edward Moat was not raised in a Christian home. Edward Moat's parents owned a pub and totally neglected him. He was basically grew up on the streets. But he heard a sermon by a famous pastor of that time and dedicated his life to Christ. At 18 years old, he was baptized. 
didn't become a preacher. He went and worked in a cabinet shop. He was a cabinet maker's apprentice, lived his whole life doing that, built his sort of his, his fortune and everything, and then became a preacher at 55 years old. But I was raised in a Christian family, but I will tell you, like, I'm an unlikely Christian because <laughs> I'm probably the most distrusting person that you'll meet about almost everything. I'm so skeptical and so I, I my struggle with cynicism, like my BS detector set on stun. Like I'm always like, I don't believe that. I, I say that over and over. Anything I hear on the news or any, I don't care who it is, you're like, that's not true. Not true. That's me, you know, and, and, and I don't like like bumper stickers and I don't like cliches and I don't like, you know, and it's like I work with my hands. I'm not like some sort of, you know, someone who would just like, you know, metaphysical things. I, I don't like any of that stuff. And so why would I believe this carpenter from 2,000 years ago? See, it's like I realize, like, oh, at the heart of it all, I believe there's absolute truth. There has to be. Come on, there has to be. There are some things that are just true, and you can't change them. It's not everything. There's a lot of things that are subjective, and that's sort of the difference between designers and architects. Like, designers can go, you know what the best color is? It's agreeable gray. And right now, that's true. Like, everybody's painting agreeable gray. That's your tip for the day. It looks fantastic. That's what's in the men's bathroom and the ladies' bathroom. Stick your head in there. It's agreeable gray. I had plenty in my sprayer just because everybody likes it. And we go, that's the best color <laughs> until it's not, right? Because in 10 years, we'll go... God, it's like, remember in the 1970s when everything was like avocado green and orange? And that was so cool. Like, I remember my parents built a house then, and they had an avocado. It was so modern. I was like, this is so, I just can't believe we have something modern. We're so poor. But we had avocado refrigerator, and we had orange, like, Formica countertops. And we had like a green stove and it was like, this is happening. It's like the Brady Bunch until like, because we were poor, like the next year, like nobody has that anymore. <laughs> and so you look back, it's so funny because I do remods and stuff and see this, like the, the, the few houses that have kept that, it looks ridiculous. But what we don't realize is like, oh, that was the best design of the time. And so much of our world that you and I are worried about, and we're like, oh, I hope our kids don't get involved. That's all going to be gone because it's not good design. It's just fashion. But architecture, like the principles of architecture, really haven't changed. And engineering, <laughs> certainly not. Plumbing? No. Water still <laughs> runs downhill. I'm saying the nice version of that. Plumbers will tell you something different. But, but, but here's the thing. like, None of that stuff changes. And Edward Moat realized that back in 1834. Now, and the reason why I'm a Christian is because I've experienced that. I've experienced that Jesus is real. And even as a cynical guy, a you know, a guy in the trades, a guy who works with his hands, I'm not super emotional or, or, you know, sort of interested in metaphysical things and I'm super skeptical, but man, I just know that there's some things that are true. And there's some things that are completely subjective, like you could tell me, oh, I don't like gray, I like tan in my house, oh, that's fine. I like green walls, fine, that's your truth. But you can't tell me I don't need walls because that's not true anymore because your roof is not going to hover and you need a foundation still after all this time <laughs> after all this time this song is still true like on Christ the solid it's about building on rock and not on sand after all these years that's still true now maybe you're here this morning and, and I totally get that and you're like oh construction and Don and dudes and old white guys and oh, I get that but I want to introduce you to one more person and she couldn't be more different. And I want the band to come back up here and sing that for us. And I heard about her this week and I just had to include her because I was like, oh. If you read, sort of think about the people I've talked about, they're all guys, they're all sort of uh, construction, blah, blah, blah. But I want to introduce you to Leah. Um, I believe it's Leah Sherabu. And she's from Nigeria. Um, and this is going to be tough to say. Um, she was 14 when this picture was taken. 
I got a daughter that's turning 16. I can't even imagine this. And she was at the girls' school for science and technology in Nigeria when Boko Haram came and kidnapped her and 124 of her classmates. And that was over a year ago. And the only communication she's had since is a video that I saw this week from her to her mother. And she said these words. She said, my mother, you should not be disturbed. I know it's not easy missing me, but I want to assure you that I am fine where I am, and I'm confident that one day I shall see your face again. If not here, then there at the bosom of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, Leah made a choice last year. Over 120, I think 122 of the girls have been released. Um, Boko Haram is an Islamic mil militant group, and they converted. They converted to Islam and were allowed to, they say released, probably married to someone, but they were not slaves anymore. Um, Leah held out. As far as we know, Leah's alive and still holding out. Leah decided that she would not renounce her faith in Jesus Christ. Leah's a Christian. She's based her life. on the rock and she thinks at 15 that it's a better deal to live as a slave now because this is not all there is and so I want to pray with you really quickly but I also want to invite you as this song is played to sort of think about where you're at. Are you a wise builder or a foolish builder? I don't know. You have to decide that. You have to think about, like, are you building on permanent or temporary things? And if you had to look, look through who you listen to, you know, what influences you? Are they mostly decorators? Are they mostly that are talk, people that are talking about the latest thing? Or do you have any connection at all to the ancient, 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 deep principles of Jesus and the faith that don't change? So I want to leave you with that, and I want to pray with you, and I just want to invite you to decide where you're at. I did this week. I never thought, why would I tell people? Why would I tell people to follow Christ? And I would say, because it's rock, and it doesn't change, and we need something that is lasting, because everything else is shifting and sinking sand. Dear Jesus, God, we are so, so grateful for this rock that we could build on. And God, we are so, so grateful for people who would uh, give their morning to not just eat breakfast or not just cook breakfast, to kind of hear truth. And God, it's a strange thing to do to come and sit in a room and hear these ancient sort of stories and ancient words, but God, we need them so much. God, I pray that we would be people built on rock and not on sand. In your name we pray, amen.